is light. In your light, we see light. Please, God, by the power of your spirit, explain to us the mysteries which are for you and your children, your word says. God, we stand on the promise. It says if we lack wisdom, we ask God. The promise of your word, if we call to you, you will show us great and mighty things that we don't know. We know nothing, God, so there's a lot to show us. Be with us, God. Teach us your word tonight, please. We ask it in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, the last three chapters of Job. Finally, we've got to it. Took us 39 chapters to figure out everybody that was giving him advice, with the exception of that Elihu guy, was a fool. But the Lord does something really crazy in chapter 40, 41, and 42. He kind of leaves off where he started. If you were here some months ago, in Job chapter 1, it's the craziest thing. Now, in case you don't know, Job is a contemporary, some say, of Abraham. His, his, his genealogy goes all the way back to then. And in chapter 1, you don't have to turn there unless you're fast turner. Verse 6 says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Then we start to see what looks like it's going to be a book of weird spiritual stuff. But it's not. We see the logic of man. And the one question that is asked over and over again is why do bad things happen to good people? If there's a God, and he's all-powerful, and there's a devil, and he's all-evil, then why doesn't God just do away with him? That means God's either not all-good, or God's either not all-powerful, if you look at it from a human perspective, of course. And you know what we find out? Let's jump ahead just a second to the end of today's Bible study. We find out that question never gets answered. There is no answer to it. Except this. Quoting from Chuck Smith, he says, We look at things based on our comfort yesterday, today, and tomorrow. God sees an eternity. And he's looking to make us equitable. He's looking to make us profitable. He's looking to take care of us in eternity. And the Bible says that the sufferings of our present age don't compare to the glory that will be revealed. That's the answer. It's not the answer that you were looking for. As they said in that movie, uh, Jerry Maguire, it ain't sexy, but it's an answer. It's not funny. It's really not. Why doesn't God ever answer that question? He always answers questions with more questions. Isn't that annoying when he does that? With that introduction, moreover, the Lord answered Job, verse 1, chapter 40, and said, Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? He who rebukes God, let him answer it. Please give me your attention. If you go back just a couple of chapters, Job telling his friends, if I was granted an audience with God, a court before the king, if I can just have a minute to talk to him, I would plead my case and he would find me innocent. You guys remember? Well, guess what happened? You know the old saying, you better be careful what you wish for because you might just get it? Here we go. I see a lot better with these. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. 
What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yes, twice, but I will proceed no further. Then the Lord, now you know what, before that, if you look through the Bible at all the men who have actually had an audience with God, I want you to think about them. Peter, exposed to the Lord for the first time, what did he say? I am a man undone, depart from me. Wouldn't even lift his face to look at him. Isaiah. Do you remember anybody remember what Isaiah said? Isaiah, if you pronounce it in the original. He said, woe unto me, for I am a man undone. I'm a foul-mouthed man amongst foul-mouthed people. You know what the crazy thing about the Lord is for human beings? He's a mirror. He is a mirror. And the more you see God and the clearer you see God, the clearer you see yourself for what you really are. And you know what we really are? Horrible. Sinful. Weak. It's my pastor. Um, I have a pastor named Raz. He, he has a church in Miami. I call him Razmataz. I say, Pastor Raz, I'm having marriage problems. I say, Pastor Raz, I'm having church problems. I say, Pastor Raz, I'm having problem problems. He says to me, Ryan, you got to spend time with Jesus. I says, Raz, I do spend time with Jesus. He says, apparently not enough. <laughs> I know what you mean, Raz. Raz always says something to me interesting. He always says, Ryan, never forget. The best of men are at best men. I love that. The best of men are at best men. Gotta spend time with Jesus. I love Raz. He's such a humble guy. <clears throat> then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Now prepare yourself like a man. And I will question you, and you shall answer me. Would you indeed annul my judgment? Would you condemn me that you may be justified? Have you an arm like God, or can you thunder with a voice like his? And adorn yourself with majesty and splendor, and array yourself with glory and beauty. Disperse the rage of your wrath. Look on everyone who is proud and humble him. Look on everyone who is proud and bring him low. Tread down the wicked in their place. Hide them in the dust together. Bind their faces in hidden darkness. Then I will confess to you that your own right hand can save you. Next time we want to tell God how we think things should go. Have you ever done that? Have you ever had a situation and you say, you know, God, I have a great idea. I have a great idea. If you would just save this person like that, heal this person like that, stop this person. If I would just pray, listen, God, I've been praying for that person. Don't let them, don't let them, God, don't let, the God, I've been praying for that person. And then they die anyway. And you're like, man, I was sure God was going to do something miraculous. Well, how do you know he didn't? Because they died. We have this, uh, <laughs> we had this girl that came into church years ago. I don't remember her name. She was Jamaican. But every time she'd come in, she goes, Now, Ryan, I don't want you to pray for me today. How come? Every time you pray for me, things get worse in my life. <laughs> things get worse. Things get so bad. I said, How do you know it's my fault? Every time you pray, don't pray for me. Things get so bad. <laughs> so next time you tell God what he should do, then you do a few of these things that he's talking about. You know, humble the prideful. And I love, I love verse 11. The first part of verse 11 is, disperse the rage of your wrath. I love the first line he says. If you really want to be like God, here's what you need to do. Next time you get angry, don't act out on it. 
Well, that disqualifies Ryan. Continuing, look now at the behemoth which I made along with you. Okay, let me give you a little um, explanation 15 through 24. Now, stay with me. Does anybody know the battles that, that every Christian struggles with, the three battles? Does anybody ever hear the three things that we battle with? Every Christian battles with three things. Number one, the flesh. Number two, the enemy, Satan the devil. And number three, the world. Those are the three battles. We don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and rulers of the darkness of the age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. We battle three things. Number one, ourselves. The very fibers of our being desire what is wicked, what is evil, the seven deadly sins are ever upon us. You know them. Lust, sloth, pride. Huh? Envy, vengeance, wrath, and gluttony. I mean, that just, I, need, I should get a shirt that says those things because those are like my favorite things. Wow, those are my favorite things. What he's going to do is describe for us now what some have called the flesh. The very picture that he paints is of an animal that no longer exists. Or maybe it never did. And maybe he's talking about the very chambers of the darkest heart that we have. Remember where we, we started. We started with Satan coming before God. And then all this wisdom of man thrown at him for 30 some odd chapters. Listen to this description of this creature. Look now at the behemoth which I made along with you. Now if you'll notice the word along in your Bible is italicized which means in the New King James, it was added for continuity. But I think it kind of confuses. Now look at the behemoth which I made with you. It is with you. It is a part of you. <laughs> he eats grass like an ox. See now, his strength is in his hips. And his power is in his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. His bones are like beams of bronze. His ribs are like bars of iron. He is the first of the ways of God. Only he who made him can bring near his sword. Surely the mountains yield food for him, and all the beasts of the field play there. He lies under the lotus tree in a covert of reeds and marsh, the lotus trees cover him with their shade. The willow by the brook surround him. Indeed, the rivers may rage, yet he's not disturbed. He's confident, though the Jordan gushes into his mouth, though he takes it into his eyes, or one pierces his nose with a snare. Now, I've heard so many different people tell me what that animal is. Anybody want to take a stab at what he's describing? Really? Really? And does a hippopotamus have a tail like a cedar? I know, but I just asked you a question. Does he have a tail like a cedar? Okay. It's this little tiny thing that flips around. You see it, it, it sprays poop everywhere. When it, You ever watch videos of hippos? They're the funniest animals. Do you know that hippo kills more people in Africa, more than any other animal in all Africa? Hippo can bite you in half. Dangerous animal. So what is that animal? You know what it sounds like he's describing more than anything else if I was a betting man? A what? A witch? It sounds like a brontosaurus, doesn't it? Because if you're looking at it, if you're describing it, well, it's probably, you read it, and you probably, well, I know what he's describing. A crocodile. Because crocodiles are from that area, the Nile, right? It was, wait a second, do crocodiles eat grass? No, they don't eat grass. That ends that one. 
Or maybe he was describing the animal instinct that all, we all possess. Who knows? Listen to this next animal he describes. Can you draw out Leviathan with a hook or snare his tongue with a line which you lower? You guys have heard that name Leviathan. It's been the story, a much ballyhooed story of mythical creatures. Nobody knows what it is. What does your book say? A Leviathan's a crocodile. Who wrote your book? There you go. There's your first problem. <laughs> Can you put a reed through his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he make many supplications to you? Will he speak softly to you? Will he make a covenant with you? Will you take him as a servant forever? Will you play with him as with a bird? Or will you leash him for your maidens? Will your companions make a banquet of him? Will they apportion him among the merchants? Can you fill his skin with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? Lay your hand on him. Remember the battle. Never do it again. Indeed, any hope of overcoming him is false. Shall one be overwhelmed at the sight of him? No one is so fierce that he would dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand against me? Who has preceded me that I should pay him? Everything under heaven is mine. Now, I want you to really pay attention to the next few verses which he continues to describe, which we think he continues to describe this sea creature. But I want you to tune in. I will not conceal his limbs, his mighty power, or his graceful proportions. Who can remove his outer coat? Who can approach him with a double bridle? Who can open the doors of his face with his terrible teeth all around? His rows of scales are his pride, shut up tightly as with a seal. One is so near another that no air can become between them. They are joined one to another. You see, that's the first reason why it can't be a crocodile. You ever see the belly of a crocodile? Oh, it's smooth. It's nice. They are joined one to another. They stick together and cannot be parted. He, now listen to this. His sneezings flash forth light, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth goes burning lights. Sparks of fire shoot out. Smoke goes out of his nostrils as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. His breath kindles coals, and a flame goes out of his mouth. Strength dwells in his neck, and sorrow dances before him. The folds of his flesh are joined together. They are firm on him and cannot be moved. His heart, stay with me now, guys. His heart is stone, even as hard as the lower millstone. When he raises himself up, the mighty are afraid because of his crashings. They are beside themselves. Though the sword reaches him, it cannot avail, nor does spear, dart, or javelin. He regards iron as straw and bronze as rotten wood. The arrows cannot make him flee. Sling stones become like stubble to him. Darts are regarded as straw. He laughs at the threats of javelin. His undersides are like sharp potsherds. He spreads pointed marks in the mire. He makes the deep boil like a pot. He makes the sea like a pot of ointment. He leaves a shining wake behind him. One would think that the deep had white hair. On the earth there is nothing like him which is made without fear. Watch now. Here it is. He beholds every high thing. He is king over all the children of pride. Now who would he describe? How did we go from describing this behemoth, this Leviathan now, to he is king over the children of pride? First battle is the flesh, that behemoth. That flesh is tough. The second battle, it's the enemy of our soul. If you would keep your place here, we will come back. Turn just a few pages to the right to Isaiah chapter 27. I want to show you something here that starts to make a little bit of sense. In that day, 
Does anybody know what that is? Does anybody know the phrase of the Bible in that day? What day? Anybody? The day of the Lord. That great and terrible day. The day that he finally puts our enemies under his footstool. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. That is what he's talking about, Isaiah. In that day, the Lord, with his severe sword, great and strong, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent. Leviathan, that twisted serpent, and he will slay that reptile that is in the sea. I think this is just cool stuff. If there's really a creature out there called the Leviathan and it's a fire-breathing dragon, oh, wait a second, dragon, did I say the word dragon? Who is called the dragon in the book of Revelation? That beast of old, the devil and the dragon. Turn back to the book of Job. These are just great speculatory things. There's no way to know. Anybody who describes anything, I'm sorry, anybody who interprets anything that Job describes is it's the first person you should say, you know what, I'm never going to listen to this person again because nobody can tell you who, what he's talking about. But the application, the quote-unquote spiritualizing of the text which is a dangerous thing to do, so we don't do it often, I see. He says to Job, in chapter 1 and 2, he doesn't say anything to Job. He says, Job is yours, Satan. Just don't kill him. And Job has a flipping field day. <laughs> Job goes to town. I'm sorry. Satan goes to town on Job. No man has suffered pain like Job physically, mentally, spiritually. No point in time did we see up till now, and God spoke to Job, and God spoke to Job. No. The only one who spoke to Job was his wife telling him to curse God and die. His friends telling him, well, you must have done something wrong. God doesn't punish people for no reason, you know. Now God shows up, and the first thing he says to Job is, oh, Job, you're so smart, right? Let's, uh, let's straighten this out, me and you. You wanted, a, you, wanted a, a count, you wanted a counsel with God? You wanted to plead your case? Well, before you plead your case, let me ask you a few questions. Verse 1, chapter 42. Here's where we finish. And finish with Job. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. It's a funny thing. The proper response to God's sovereignty, guys, please, the proper response to God's sovereignty is, you have my best interest in mind. And I look to all eternity, for you are my escape, for you are my shield, my strength, my source. You know better. Why take, why take my children? Because, because you know better. Why take, why let, why this, why? Because I know better and I have your best interests in mind is the only answer you get. Why do bad things happen? In just going through the last few things in our lives, if you think about it, you look around at the terrible things that have happened in some of our lives. Terrible on a daily scale maybe, maybe a 48-hour scale. But in the long run, he's working out a far more exceeding weight of glory. You know that verse? Job finally figures it out. Like he figured it out from the beginning, like he knew. You asked... Who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. How does a man who lost ten children, goodness knows how many months he's been sitting scratching the boils off his skin, 
How does a man like that look at God and, and say, I, I utter things which are too wonderful for me? How? Man, there's some major faith going on. This guy's amazing. This, I, I'd, I'd put him in that category of the A word that I, I rarely use for people. He's awesome. Job's awesome. Listen, please, let me speak. You said I will question you and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Everybody that sees God, the same response in Scripture over and over again. Ugh, my God, I'm so sorry. Ah. You remember when Samson's parents saw, saw the Lord? Ah, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Read the book of Revelation. I fell down as dead, John said. I saw him and I fell down as dead. I couldn't even move. I was at nothing in me. No breath in me. I was done. Just the very sight of God. <laughs> you know what's the crazy thing? Never forget. I think I've said this before. The first day I got to prison, I got there, I sat down on my bunk, and I said, this is where I belong. I'm amongst my people because I'm an animal and I belong in a cage. I think it was the first time I actually saw God and I saw myself as I really was. And aren't I glad that God didn't say, that's right, that's who you are, that's what you are, and that's where you're going to stay. No, God said, okay, now let's get to business. We've got a year to do this. Let's go. <laughs> Not bad. And so it was, after the Lord had spoken these words to Job, that the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is aroused against you and your two friends. I love you didn't mention this. You and your two friends. For you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now, any pastor that has ever quoted from the book of Job and ignored the seventh verse of the 47th chapter, I fear that they will hear that exact same admonition from God. Do you know how many people use the words of the men that tried to discourage Job from life? Job is not the... Remember, all through the book of Job, we've been looking at for the last few months, and I've said to you guys all the same thing. Listen, be, don't, don't listen to that. Don't, that's not true. That's, don't pay attention to that. Don't, you might have asked yourself, wait, if it's the Bible, if he's reading the Bible, why does he say don't listen to that? Because of this verse. Listen again. My wrath is aroused against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. Now therefore, take for yourself seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering and my servant Job shall pray for you and I will accept him lest I deal with you according to your folly because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. Hey, let me tell you something, guys. You might not know this, but you here that teach the word of God you guys that go to the um, convalescent homes, you guys that are going to go into prisons, uh, you guys that teach at other churches, any, play, any guys you, you do uh, funerals or mem memorials, you heed this verse and you heed it well. You be careful. Lest you have nobody to pray for you. I worry about the men who have passed on from pastor to fallen angel, so to speak, where they say now, who are you going to go to pray for you? I hope you got somebody to pray for you when the time comes. Pastor, fill in the blank, because you have not spoken of him what is right. Man, I tell you what, every time I step up here, 
I get too out of hand with myself. Let me in case you don't know what tomorrow morning looks like, let me let you know. 6.30, because they set the clocks back, my two little dogs are going to wake up. And my daughters let them outside, and, and here's the line they make. I have, they let them out one door, and then they run to my bedroom door and start scratching on it. And that's what they, they just make this circle. 6.30, and I'm like, oh, ho, ho. good morning. And the first step out of bed is, God, I hope I, I, hope I, I represented your word well. I hope I represented your spirit rightly, God. I hope and I pray that you'll forgive me for screwing anything up yesterday. Please. Every single Monday and every single Thursday, I start that prayer. Because woe unto me when I think I can do anything without God. I might have never told you the story, but I have a very close friend who, who um, he fell into... Uh, infidelity. is a very close pastor of mine about 20, 22, 23 years ago. He's since been restored, thank God. But he showed up to my work right after it happened, maybe six months after it happened. And I looked at him and I said, dude, why? And he looked at me and he goes, Ryan, I woke up one day and I told God what I was doing for him. I woke up one day and I looked at God and I said, Look at what I'm doing for you. I'm preaching your word. I'm leading people to I, I started telling God all the things I was doing for him. It was all downhill from there. It was, um, I think it was the Lord Jesus. Yes, it was. The Lord Jesus said in one of the gospels, he said, he says, don't tell yourself, I've done this or I've done that. Think to yourself, I'm an unprofitable servant. I've done what my duty was to do. I've only done the minimal. I've done the minimal. You guys remember that parable? I just, it's all coming back to me now. When the guy says, when somebody comes in from the field, do you say to your servant, oh, sit down, let me serve you? No. You say to your servant, hey, you know what you do? Make me a bowl of food, sit down, you know, put some water out, whatever, and then you can feed yourself. Don't say to God what you've done for him. You've done nothing for God. What have you ever done for God that he didn't give you the ability to do anyway? Dangerous place. So Eliphaz the Timonite, verse 9, and Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Namathite, went and did as the Lord commanded them. For the Lord had accepted Job. And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then all his brothers all his sisters and all those who had been his acquaintances before came to him and ate food with him in his house. And they consoled him and comforted him for all the adversity that the Lord had brought upon him. Each one gave him a piece of silver and each a ring of gold. We looked at first the flesh. Then we looked at the enemy, the devil. And now we're looking at the world. And one by one, God has helped Job overcome them. And I ask you a question. And this is a question I heard from Chuck Smith say. Where were all these people when he was going through his suffering? Or did they wait till he got restored till they started coming back around again? Hey, can we be friends again? Here's a piece of silver. Here's a gold ring. Hey, that's called favor in the world. Only God can give us favor in the world. God can look at us and bless us so that the world comes to us and says, what do you got that's different? Why is it that you... Now, what happened with Job in the world? Think about this. Did the world see Job prosper above them? Um, no. The world just watched Job suffer worse than any man in the history of man up until the Lord Jesus. And they watched him get through it. And they watched Job start, and they watched God start to restore Job. And it was what Job did through the trials that made the world come to him. Not that he didn't go through trials. The Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. Coming to the Lord Jesus isn't going to end your problems. As a matter of fact, it might make them a lot worse. A lot worse. Don't pray for me today, please, Ryan. Things get so bad. But it's how you go through them when they're bad. That shows the world around you. 
I say this in humility, and I say this in, in complete, I, I swear I say this in humility. Ryan, have you mourned? Ryan, do you cry? Ryan, do you this? I don't cry for dead people. It's just rarely a thing with me. I know where they are. I cry for living people. There's that scripture verse when the Lord was following the two sisters. And he says, didn't I tell you, he says to Martha and Mary, that if you believed, you'd see, you'd see God? And then the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Why did Jesus weep? He wept because of their unbelief. He wept because of their pain. He wept because they did not know apparently what he did. Lazarus lives. Phyllis lives. I love what the Lord said to Moses at the burning bush. Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He didn't say, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What did he say? I am. God bless you. They all still live to him. Everybody lives to God. If you lived for God. Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters, and he called the name of his first Jemima. His first daughter was named Jemima. She discovered a recipe for pancake syrup. So good! You know what Jemima means? Dove. Jemima means dove. The name of the second, Kezia. You know what that means? Cassia, which is a sweet fragrance. Cassia. And the third is Karen Hapuk, which means horn of paint. Now, why you would name a daughter horn of paint? I don't know, like bucket of paint? She's a bucket of paint, that girl. Doesn't have that sweet ring as Jemima or dove or sweet aroma. Bucket of paint. Huh? Is that what it says in your Bible? Is that what it says in there? Because in the, in the, in the, literal, the literal translation, just horn of paint. You know, like they used to carry things. They didn't have buckets back in the day, so they'd get horns, ram's horns, goat horns, and they'd, they'd seal up one end and they'd pour things in it, and that's how they'd walk around with any supplies they needed, whether it be paint, water, or so forth and so on. And you're saying, what is it? It's just a colorful, colorful ray. Colorful ray. That sounds like a little sanctified imagination. I like it. <laughs> in all the land, there were found no women so beautiful as the daughters of Job. Um, sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. He's lucky I wasn't born then. There you go, Ryan. No, I didn't really do it. I, got I was going to, and then I was like, God's watching. I better not. And their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. And this, after this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and grandchildren for four generations. So Job died old and full of days. Abraham lived 180 years. Job lived 180 years. He was 40 years old when this happened. He lived another 140 years. Now, scientifically speaking, I can explain to you exactly why men lived a lot longer back then, even after the flood. But that's another Bible study. He saw his great, great, great grandchildren. Told him the story of when he was just a young man how God afflicted him, and how he got through it with the help of a few friends. Maybe the Beatles were right. I get by with a little help from my... No, sorry. <sighs> Thus, we got through Job. Now... Question for you. 
We have been going through Psalms on the first Wednesday of every month. And we read like crazy the book of Proverbs all the time. We go through that also. So I'm going to do something a little extraordinary. I've never done this before. We're going to skip Proverbs and Psalms, and we're going to go right to Ecclesiastes. Everybody cool with that? Because if we start Psalms, I'm afraid the Lord will return before we finish it. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for the um, amazing wisdom that your word has. God, I pity everybody who reads your word that doesn't have your spirit. And I pray everybody who does not know your word. God, thank you so much that you help us to overcome our flesh, the behemoth, the enemy, Leviathan, and the world, our family. God, thank you so much for the promises of God, which are yes and amen, and they never fail. Heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will by no means pass away. Thank you, God. In your name, sweet Jesus. Amen. Amen.